Hello, it's a pleasure to welcome you for this uh, webinar. My name is Sebastian Tamroin. I'm the CSO of Transcure Bioservices. And in collaboration with Mutiny Biotech, uh, I will be happy today to, to guide you through the use of the humanized mice for immune oncology uh, preclinical research. So just a few words about Transcure Bioservices. Uh, 10 years ago, we started this CR. We are now based in France, uh, 70 collaborators, including 21 PhD. And we really have focused our company on developing a more predictive advanced mouse model. And among them, the two uh, most important models, I would say, are the humanization of the immune system. I will focus my talk today uh, on this model but also the humanization of the liver, so the ability to reconstitute human hepatocytes, a fully humanized liver in a rodent model. So let's go back uh, to the humanization of the immune system. So being able to humanize animals, give a powerful tools to then use those models for different disease uh, platforms, disease model. The subject of today would be immune oncology, but we have gathered uh, tons of data over the years on the use of those animals for infectious disease. We have a BSL-2, BSL-3 animal and lab facility where we can conduct HIV, HBV-related experiments, model of inflammation, IBD, asthma, uh, fibrosis of the lung, of the liver, uh, GVHD. So all these models could be uh, used to determine efficacy of action of a compound. The toxicity, the immune toxicity, uh, can be also assessed in humanized mice. It's become being more and more important nowadays to assess if your therapy will induce uh, cytokine release syndrome, overactivation of the T cells, and so on. And being able to do it in the context of a full human immune system is very important. So this slide really summarizes what we mean by advanced human immune system mouse model. We start from highly immunodeficient animals, not skid IL-2 receptor gamma mutated animals, those animals do not have any B, T, or NK cells from murine origin. So you only uh, get some residual macrophages that are partially defective because of the IL receptor 2 gamma uh, mutation. Those animals are very good recipients for engraftment with hematopoietic stem cells. So CD34 positive cells are engrafted into those animals. We let the system maturate for 14 weeks, and we end up with a mouse that has a full human immune system from the dendritic cells, the monocytes, the NK, the T, the B lymphocytes. All the cells are there, functional, able to interact with each other. The first step when you want to humanize animals is to have good hematopoietic stem cells. And the purification of the hematopoietic stem cells from cord blood is uh, performed using the Multimax uh, from Miltini. So using this machine in combination with the CD34 microbit kit, we are able to achieve a positive selection of the hematopoietic stem cells with a high purity of 95%, with less than 2% of contaminating human CD3. And the ability of getting a high purity of hematopoietic stem cells is really key to get good humanized animals that will not develop GVHD over the time. The protocol that we use to humanize those animals is depicted on this slide. The first step is to make room in the bone marrow. And to do that, we have to choose a protocol and optimize a protocol that is based on chemoablation. So we use busulfan to make room in the bone marrow of those animals before the engraftment of the hematopoietic stem cells. 
The choice of using the chemo ablation rather than irradiation is based on the fact that irradiation are known to cause anemia over the time into those animals. So you have more robust animals using the chemo ablation protocol, animals that are stable over the time for their health, but also for their humanization rate. The second advantage that we have is that we produce those mice in advance. So you don't have to wait 14 weeks to start your experiment. About 200 animals are humanized every week just to cope with the demand. So you can really start your experiment right after signature. Those animals have been QC by flow cytometry and the main immune cells population have been characterized. All these human immune cells do express what they are supposed to express in terms of receptor. This is a non-exhaustive list of different markers that we use, I would say, in the day-to-day to to characterize uh, the main immune cells population. But really the take-home message from this slide is really that every time that we look at the different markers, that marker is expressed by the cell of interest, so no hole in the system. And and thanks to the the pickup fridge from Miltini, it's a really great tool to have easily access to antibodies. Uh, We can set up new panels for customers, optimize those panels up to 14 colors per panel to really decipher how the human immune systems do react into those animals. Humanized mice, as I say, has a full, have a full reconstitution of all the immune cells population. But nevertheless, one drawback is the fact that myeloid dendritic cells, even NK cells, are poorly reconstituted into those animals. The strategy that we have chosen to develop and optimize over the year is based on a technique called isonomic gene delivery. Using large volume of saline solution that contain plasmid coding for those human growth factor, we can get a very transient at the very moderate level expression of human cytokines. We have optimized different uh, cocktails for myeloids, for dendritic cells, for NK cells, as you can see on this slide. Expression of cytokines will last for a few days, then goes back to the normal. But this transient expression of cytokines will have a profound and stable impact on the cell lineage that you want to boost into those animals. So on this slide, we can compare what is the normal situation. So non-boosted animals, you mostly have T and B cells, percentages of NK, mono, dendritic cell are quite low. Thanks to the boost with the different cocktails of cytokines, we can increase the percentages of monocytes, of dendritic cells up to 20%, but also the amount of NK cells within the system. We have also validated the fact that we can combine the two boosts into the same animals to get a little bit more of everything and being more uh, close to what is the situation in a real patient. Looking at percentages is uh, cool, is very informative, but sometimes percentages could be misleading. So having access to absolute count is also key to uh, know what you are doing working with those humanized mice. You can see on this graph uh, absolute number of cells per ml of blood. Before, after the boost, uh, black dots, uh, we can show an increase in the absolute nerve level of myeloid cells, monocytes. We have also investigated uh, conventional plasma cytodendritic cells, DC type 1, DC type 2. All these cells were quite difficult to observe in non-boosted animals. But thanks to the boost, we can now set up protocols, studies uh, that uh, use those cells for the mechanism of action. Peripheral blood is uh, great, of course, that's easy to, uh, to interrogate without sacrificing the animals, but it's really just the tip of the iceberg. We know that the major organs are indeed infiltrated with human immune cells. So thanks to the Gentlemax uh, octodissociator from, from Milteni in combination with various 
uh, tissue dissociation kit, we can get cell suspension out of any uh, organs from these animals. So we have characterized the humanization rate and humanization quality of the spleen, the liver, uh, the bone marrow, the intestine, the brain, the lung, uh, really a comprehensive picture of what is inside those animals, boosted, non-boosted, um, uh, and the, all these compartments, why are they important? Because they are really providing a source of human immune cells that can be mobilized when you challenge those animals, for example, with a tumor. Another example on this slide, now looking at NK cells population in boosted, non-boosted animals, boosted here with IL-15, that not only increase the total amount of NK cells in peripheral blood, but also the proportion of these cells expressing CD16. You can also observe on this slide the stability of the boost. So this is the situation before the boost, one, two percent max of NK cells. Thanks to the boost, we increase that to five, six, seven percent, and this is stable up to two months. We have validated the fact that if more time is needed, we can apply a second boost and that therefore gain for five miles, uh, for five months, sorry, of um, of higher uh, rate of NK cells, monocytodendritic cells. Mm -hmm. So let's now discuss about what can be done in the context of immunology. So what can be done to assess efficacy, mechanism of action, safety of your drug uh, acting uh, on the growth of the tumors via immune cells, or we also have customers that wants to see, and you will have uh, examples about that, how by targeting the tumor cells specifically, there is also a contribution of the immune cells. So we start, of course, with these humanized mice, boosted, non-boosted. If we have to boost the animals, the animal is boosted one week before the engraftment of the tumor. Tumor are engrafted. Most of the models that we have developed are based on sub-Q uh, engraftment, but we start to have more and more autotopic uh, mouse model as well. The growth of the tumor is followed either by caliper or by uh, bioluminescence, if we have a tumor that expresses luciferase, for example. We follow the growth over the time. We can collect blood uh, at different time points for PK analysis. When the tumor reach uh, the ethical limit, we do sacrifice the animals, collect whatever needs to be collected, and uh, analyze uh, by flow cytometry to, to decipher how the immune systems do react to the treatment. Most of the tumor that grow in non-humanized mice, in mute mice, uh, uh, can be grown as well in humanized mice. Uh, as a rule of thumb, I would say that about 90-95% of all the tumors that grow well in, uh, in nude mice will grow eventually in uh, humanized mice. But what you can see on this uh, slide is that the immune system will react anyway to the tumor that you do engraft. And it can react on both way, on both sides. It can either fight the tumor that's the case for melanoma cells, known to be quite uh, immunogenic. So those tumors will grow slower in humanized mice compared to non-humanized mice. But for some other tumors, you can have the uh, other way around, the opposite situation, glioblastoma, will grow faster in humanized mice compared to non-humanized mice. It really shows you here that you have the two phases of the kind, the pro-tumor, the anti-tumor action of the immune system. So without working with higher related drugs, you can see here that the human immune system that is reconstituted is able to, to interact uh, with the tumor and, and create some microenvironment. So those tumors are indeed infiltrated. By immunohistochemistry, we can show that. We have all the facility in-house to perform uh, IHC, chromogenic or fluorescence. You have here an example with CD4, CD8, 
uh, positive human cells at the vicinity, but also at the center of the tumor. So it's a, a very homogeneous infiltration by human immune cells. But you will see in a few slides that, is, that this infiltration is largely dependent of the CDX that you do implant. HC is great, but for most of our customers, they want to uh, have a more thorough investigation of how the immune cells infiltrate the tumor, are activated within the tumor. So definitely flow cytometry uh, are key uh, to go in that direction. So combining the flow cytometry capabilities that we have with three flow cytometers, up to 14 channels in each of them, with the gentle MAC dissociator and the human tumor dissociation kit, we can get single cell suspension out of a tumor and analyze everything by flow to get a more comprehensive picture of how those human immune cells uh, play their role. We can do that after, before treatment, of course, but we can also use that technology to characterize better the different models, the different CDX, PDX model that we propose to our customer. On this slide, you see hot versus cold tumor, uh, example of hot tumor and the MB231, more than 5 million of human immune cells per gram of tumor, that's a lot, compared to RKO, colon carcinoma, only 3,000 human immune cells per gram of tumor. So you see that the, the window uh, where you can play in hot versus cold is quite large. And we have customers that uh, wants to face, thing, to face uh, more challenging tumors with less infiltration, or we have customers that wants to start, for example, with a tumor that is well infiltrated, just as a proof of concept. Amount of cells, quantity of cells is important, but uh, of course we can do better. And the quality of the immune system uh, is also characterized. So we have about 30, 35 different CDX models where we have this kind of data and we can use those data to suggest uh, the best model to our customer based on their mechanism of action. As you can see on this slide, we have some tumors that are infiltrated mostly with T cell, CD4, CD8. Uh, some tumors do have T-Rex, some tumors do not have any T-Rex. Some tumors are highly infiltrated with macrophages, some do not have at all. Some tumors have a large proportion of NK cells, so maybe a great model for ADCC-related activity. So we can really play with all these CDX models to recommend the most appropriate model based on the mode of action. Another interesting uh, feature of these humanized mice is the fact that the T cells in naive animals, in non-challenged animals, the T cells are are quiet. So you do not have exhaustion or overactivation of the T cells. That's also why you don't get GVHD over the time into those animals. But the good news is that once those cells start to infiltrate the tumor, and you have here an example with HCT116 tumor cells, those cells start to express markers of activation, exhaustion, uh, PD-1, CD-68, uh, TGIT, and so on. So those, uh, tum those immune cells are really able to do the job, migrate the tumor, modify their phenotype accordingly. A first example here using MDMB231 uh, to, uh, to give you two messages. The first one is, as you can see on this graph, that already with N equal five, so five animals per group, you can get very significant data a very good TGI here using DOCS, doxorubicin, as a positive control. So that the first take home message is that humanized mice will not increase the variability of your response. Uh, sometimes we have scientists that do fear to, uh, to start working with humanized mice because of the high variability. Really, the viability is more coming from the CDX model than the humanized mice per se. The second message from this experiment is that just by inducing apoptosis of the tumor cells and therefore release of antigenic material, 
This is already sufficient to induce a dramatic infiltration of human immune cells. You get more dendritic cells, more NK cells, and even a switch in the M1, M2 macrophages balance. So just by targeting directly the tumor cells, you can see and imagine how you will get a better comprehension of what's going on in patient because here you are working in the context of a fully humanized system. Humanized mice uh, have a lot of success working with immune checkpoint inhibitors as a monotherapy or even a combination therapy. So we have screened the different CDX tumor model for the expression of PDL1. We can do that by flow cytometry in vitro. We also have data uh, by IHC to characterize the expression of PDL1 uh, in vivo in the context of the human immune system. So once those models have been characterized, we started to see how those models could respond uh, to a treatment based on immune checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, for a first example here with an anti-PD-1, so using Ketruda, 10 milligrams per kick, treating a gastric tumor CDX implanted sub -Q. What you can see here is that you have a significant but still modest TGI with 10 milligrams per kick of anti-PD-1. This is something that we do observe a lot. Working in the context of humanized mice, you will never get 100% TGI with immune checkpoint therapy as a monotherapy. So immune checkpoint inhibitor alone will never give you more than 30-35% TGI, even if you use what we call a responsive CDX. And the reason is that if you look at individual curve, here's an example with anti-CTLA4, uh, you see untreated animals treated with EPD mumbab at 20 mg per kg. You can see that two animals do respond very well, 100% TGI, while the other animals do not respond at all. So it's really mimicking what was what is the situation in patient with some patient responding very well to these new therapies while some other uh, the treatment fail and we still don't know why but not only you have access to tumor growth inhibition efficacy of your compound but thanks to the TILS analysis you will also get insight in how the immune cells do react after treatment with anti-CTA4 for example you can observe an increase of the CD8 T cells within the tumor and as well, expected a reduction of the human T-Rex uh, within those tumor. Most of the CDX, most of the PDX, if you treat them with a monotherapy based on immune checkpoint inhibitors, you will get very few percentage of TGI, sometimes uh, nothing at all. That's the example here using A375 melanoma cell lines, k in red, no efficacy at all. The blue curve is a T-cell engager uh, provided by one of our customers, a very modest TGI as well. But when you combine both, so when at the same time you release the breaking, you push on the metal to boost the immune uh, system, then you get the best and you get a very synergistic, very significant TGI by combination of the Ketruda and the T-cell engager. So this is one example. Another example of this uh, combination therapy and the synergistic effect that you can observe in humanized mice um, is depicted on this slide. So HCT116, uh, left untreated, treated with anti-PD-1. You can clearly see that one animal do respond very well to the treatment. The five other animals do not respond at all. But when you combine the anti-PD-1 with monoclonal antibodies targeting the CRP alpha CD47 pathway, pathway that is used by a monocyte macrophage to do the job, then you get, once again, a very synergistic effect with almost 100% TGI. So innate immunity, myeloid cells, dendritic cells, NK cells, the functionality of these cells could be assessed as well in humanized mice. That's the key advantage of those humanized mice compared to 
PBMC engrafted animals. So you just take PBMC from adults, you infuse those PBMC into immunodeficient animals. After a few days, you only get T cells in the system. So only the biology, the functionality of the T cells could be assessed. Uh, here using the uh, CD34 engrafted animals, you can get a full reconstitution of all the human immune cells, including monocytes, macrophages, and therefore you can test therapy, small molecules, monoclonal antibodies that are targeting those cells. Here an example with MD and B231, treated, left untreated, uh, with small molecules targeting the M1 and 2 macrophages balance. It works nicely, significant TGI. That significant TGI is only observed in boosted animals. If you do the same experiment in non-boosted animals, you don't get enough macrophages in the system, so no efficacy at all. So we're really showing you the functionality of this uh, boosting strategy in humanized mice. Same for um, NK cells, so ADCC-related activities uh, can be uh, study in humanized mice. An example here with uh, melanoma cells, CDX implanted sub-Q treated either uh, therapeutic schedule, meaning that we start the treatment when a tumor reach 51 with cubic millimeters, or a prophylactic treatment where we start the treatment right after engraftment. You can see that uh, prophylactic schedule is working even better, of course, because you intervene uh, sooner on those animals. But we take home message here is that if you want to target NK cells, uh, humanized mice uh, can be used successfully. Another example of uh, ADCC activity here comparing uh, test titan 3, uh, one of the drugs of our customer, to an anti CD38 uh, commercially available that will target uh, the myeloma cells. Uh, you can see here the positive control completely flat. So functionality at 2 mg per kg is great. The test titan 3 at 20 mg per kg was not that great, but, there, but still we were able to show by flow cytometry that treatment with uh, test titan 3 was able to upregulate the amount of NK cells infiltrating the tumor. CAR T cells, immunosafety, uh, efficacy of CAR T can be, can be assessed in humanized mice, in collaboration with the University of Besançon here in France, we published a few years ago uh, this proof of concept showing that we can isolate T cells from the spleen of humanized mice. Those T cells can be manufactured to produce CAR T, and then those CAR T can be reinjected in animals coming from the same CD34 donors than the one that were sacrificed to isolate the T cells. So in this kind of uh, study design, you work in a 100% autologous way to test efficacy and hopefully absence of immunotoxicity of your CAR T without worrying about uh, GVHD or uh, the elimination of your CAR T cells by the immune system. Oncolytic viruses, uh, oncolytic bacteria can be assessed in our facility. We are equipped with BSL2, BCL3, uh, animal and lab facilities. So we are uh, trained and authorized to work with uh, different biological agents. This slide to show you the comparison between IT intratumor versus IV injection for this virus. It works uh, as well, the, the, the two way of administration. But we can also go a little bit deeper into this kind of experiment and assess the systemic immune response. So to do that, what we what has been done here and published uh, a few years ago with Targovax is a first tumor implanted on the right flank, treated with the oncolytic viruses, IT injection, the first tumor completely disappears, and then we engraft a second tumor <clears throat> on the other flank to see how the T cells, the memory T cells are there to protect against uh, the second challenge with the tumor. And that's what you can see on this graph, the blue curve, animals pre-treated a first time with an oncolytic viruses are significantly protected against the growth of a second tumor on the other flank.
speaking about vaccination uh, in humanized mice, those animals can be used as well to uh, test tumor vaccine. Tumor vaccine either based on naked tumor peptides or nanoparticles, dendritic cells loaded with uh, such particles. You have here an example of animals, humanized mice, boosted humanized mice, uh, vaccinated with MART1, so melanoma antigen. After a few injections, you start to see in the peripheral blood clonal amplification of CD8 T cells that are specific uh, for MART1. To do that, we use dextromere staining. Another example, vaccinating the animal here with PREM1, dendritic cells loaded with PREM1. has been done in collaboration uh, with a company in Netherlands that would set up uh, vaccine uh, treatment in humanized mice. Once again here, after a few uh, injection of, uh, of PREM1 dendritic cells, we can challenge those animals with scoff treatment and observe that the, the animals that were vaccinated with the PREM1 dendritic cells were somehow protected, even if the effect is still modest, they were protected against the growth of the SCOF3 uh, tumor cells. We can also observe, if we analyze the tears of those, uh, of those tumors, that we have a very significant proportion of the T cells uh, who are a PREM1 specific within the tumor. So explaining why those tumors uh, grow slower here in red. CDX can be engrafted, but also PDX can be engrafted in humanized mice. To work with PDX, we have a very nice collaboration with Champions Oncology, having access to their full database of PDX, very well characterized, more than 1,500 PDX. Those PDX, we've optimized and developed protocols to uh, grow them in humanized mice. The strategy is in two steps. We first engraft those PDX in immunodeficient animals, let the tumor grow, resect the tumor, cut the tumor in pieces, and use those pieces of tumor fresh to engraft humanized mice. And by doing so, as you can see here, we speed up uh, the process, the, the growth of the tumor, but also reduce somehow the variability of, uh, of growth of those different PDX. So PDX, once they are implanted in humanized mice, uh, can be, of course, used to test efficacy of different uh, monoclonal antibodies, B-specific, small molecules, uh, you can name it. Here, four test candidates have been tested in, in parallel in a model of PDX in humanized mice, where you can see very good uh, TGI, but also being able to discriminate between a better candidate and uh, a less good candidate in this kind of experiment. Those PDX are, as expected, also infiltrated with human immune cells. And as described for the CDX, the profile of infiltration is really depending on the PDX and the data that we have really show that the STIRS profile is really mimicking what was the original situation in the patient. So we are really one step uh, closer to the clinic, working with PDX in the context of humanized mice. You can see on this example that we have a lot of macrophages. We have studied the M1, M2 macrophages balance, but little T cells, once again, illustrating the fact that you can have different situations in terms of infiltration and knowing well your model is really the key uh, to have uh, the best success in your experiment. So that was my last slide. Thanks again for your attention. Um, thanks again to Midini Biotech for organizing this uh, webinar with us. It was a real pleasure. Uh, I'm glad now to answer any questions that you may have about humanization, humanized mice, or the use of those humanized mice uh, for IO research. Let me know. Thanks a lot.